What is the price of fame? As music fans, we look at our heroes often with envy. We see the fancy cars, the big houses, and most importantly, the awesome guitars and gears that they can afford seemingly on a whim. The girls, or guys, the tours and the lights, but all too often there's a dark side. Drugs, alcohol. The musician we'll be talking about today was a consummate player, classically trained, versatile, melodic, and in one of the biggest rock bands of the 1980s, who were literally ruling the charts in the arenas with millions of records sold and packed worldwide tours. But the price of fame might have been too high, and it swallowed him up and made him yet another guitarist who left us way too soon. Today, we're going to look at Steve Clark of Def Leppard next on Forgotten Fretmasters. Hello friends and welcome to Forgotten Fretmasters, where we examine guitarists or musicians who for one reason or another might not have been as commercially successful as, had the longevity of, or just left us sooner than some of the other guys who often end up on all the top 10 lists. Today we're going to look at guitarist Steve Clark of Def Leppard, whose riffs and solos helped to propel the band to the highest heights of rock superstardom in the 1980s. Leopard's presence on MTV and 80s radio was ubiquitous after the releases of their massive hit albums Pyromania and Hysteria. Despite this success, however, Clark's battles with substance abuse would be another cautionary tale of a musician who flew too close to the sun. So let's take a look at the man whose bandmates nicknamed him the Riff Master. Stephen Maynard Clark was born on 23 April 1960 in Hillborough, Sheffield in the United Kingdom. He developed an interest in music at a very early age and attended a Cliff Richard in the Shadows concert at the young age of six, which fueled his interest in the guitar. His parents, Barry and Beryl, decided to foster the interest rather than suppress it, and Steve's father gifted him his first guitar, a classical, at the young age of 11. But he did have one condition, that Steve truly take serious lessons and learn how to play it the right way. Steve would take classical guitar lessons at the beginning, before being exposed to the electrifying sounds of early 70s guitar god Jimmy Page at a friend's house. As a result, Steve's world would be turned upside down and he became obsessed with the electric guitar and his love of Page and Zeppelin would continue to expire him for the rest of his career. Clark joined a small Sheffield cover band called Electric Chicken, while at the same time keeping his options open with an apprenticeship as a lathe operator at Sheffield engineering firm GEC Traction, a subsidiary of General Electric. Sometime in 1977, Clark was spotted by Pete Willis, a guitarist in Sheffield rock band Atomic Mass, and he asked Steve if he played guitar. The two struck up a conversation, and Willis told Steve that they were auditioning for a second guitarist in the band and invited him to come and try out. However, for reasons unknown, Steve decided not to show up to the audition, and a few more months would pass by. The band would change their name to Def Leppard based on an art poster that singer Joe Elliott had designed in school. Originally spelled the usual way, the band felt that the name evoked an image of a punk band and so they reworked the spelling to a more Led Zeppelin-esque feel. Meanwhile, Elliot and Willis bumped into Steve yet again at a Judas Priest concert in early 1978 and Willis again extended his invitation for Steve to come down and try out for the band. This time, however, Steve acquiesced and auditioned by playing a note-perfect rendition of Leonard Skinner's Free Bird by himself. Steve was officially offered membership in Def Leppard in January of 1978. At the time, along with Clark, the band consisted of Elliot on vocals, Rick Savage on bass, Pete Willis on second guitar, and Tony Kenning on drums. But Kenning would abruptly leave the band in November of 78, leaving the band to scramble and a temporary drummer, Frank Noon of the next band, to fill in on Leppard's first EP, which would be released in January of 1979. 
To promote the pressing, Elliot would jump on stage at Sheffield University to hand deliver the EP to BBC Radio 1 DJ John Peel, who we remember from our Bill Nelson episode. Peel began to play Get Your Rocks Off on his show, and the song would reach number 84 in the UK charts that year. In the gear department, Steve had simple, classic rock tastes. He loved his Gibson Les Pauls through Marshall JCM 800s. This tried and true matching of Gibson and Marshall goes back as far as Eric Clapton's unforgettable performance with his 1960 Les Paul standard through the Marshall Bluesbreaker amp, named after John Mayall's Bluesbreakers, who he played lead guitar for on the Beano album. Steve was known to play some other guitars over his career, even flirting with a Fender Strat at one time and a Hamer Les Paul style guitar, but a vast majority of his work was performed with a variety of Gibson Les Paul customs. He also was known to play the double neck Gibson EDS 1275, no doubt as a nod to his guitar hero, Jimmy Page. Not long after the recording of their first EP, Leopard hired the then 15 year old Rick Allen to be their full time drummer and the early lineup was complete. Throughout 1979, Def Leppard garnered a huge following in the new wave of UK hard rock and heavy metal bands, and despite having not recorded an album yet, they played some huge shows in support of bands like ACDC. They would procure a record deal, however, from Phonogram Mercury and hire a new manager, Pete Mensch, and set out to begin work on their first full-length album in December of 1979. The album that would become On Through the Night showcased Clark as a principal musical songwriter in the band, with Steve contributing to 10 out of 11 songs on the album. But the band's UK fans felt that Def Leppard were trying too hard to break into the US market with songs like Hello America, and this came to a head after a write-up in Sounds Magazine called, quote, Has the Leopard Changed Its Spots? that directly accused the band of selling out to the American market. This led to a performance at the Reading Festival that saw the band pelted with objects and bottles filled with urine. <laughs> the writer of the piece, Jeff Barton, later said that he expressed regret for the article after having a straight-up row with Leopard's manager, Pete Mensch. In the end, On Through the Night was still a solid debut from the Sheffield outfit, peaking at number 15 on the UK albums charts, and its singles, Wasted, Hello America, and Rock Brigade all performed moderately well. However, Leopard would struggle a bit in the charts in their homeland UK for a long time after this article was written. But more importantly, it brought the band to the attention of producer Robert John Lang, better known as Mutt, who is best known as the producer of ACDC's Titanic Highway to Hell and Back in Black albums, and he heard potential in the band's sound. They came together to record the band's second album, High and Dry, in early 1981. Although this album wasn't as successful as his predecessor, only managing number 26 on the UK albums charts, it did spawn a hit video on the fledgling cable channel known as MTV, with the song Bringing on the Heartbreak. Def Leppard's video for that song entered heavy rotation on the new video-based channel, and this boosted their profile in the US, which would have huge impacts for the band's future success. High and Dry showed a massive improvement in the recorded sound of the band with Mutt Lang bringing his vast experience to the guitars, especially as Steve Clark's signal chain was similar to Angus Young's of ACDC, with both players using Gibson humbucker type guitars through Marshall amps. As a result, the band's sonic potential was close to being realized fully. Leopard's touring profile also began to get on a roll, and the band opened for acts like Ozzy Osbourne and Blackfoot. As the band started to work on their third release in mid-1982, they knew this release had to be the one that broke through. The pressure was on and there could be nothing or no one that got in the way. That's why, after several incidents of Pete Willis being so inebriated that he couldn't even play his guitar, Def Leppard made the tough decision of firing Willis and replacing him the next day with ex-girl guitarist Phil Collin. Even though Clark and Willis were often together when the two got stinking drunk, Clark was usually still able to function at a high level. This, coupled with his song and riff writing ability, made Willis the odd man out. But luckily, Clark and Colin also hit it off as a duo very quickly, with Clark's technical ability playing off of Colin's often emotional and more visceral style. Colin would say, quote, We quickly became best friends. It wasn't just the guitar playing or extreme boozing. We both found that we were soaking up all that we could and learning more on the road than we had ever learned at school with a healthy appetite for new and exciting cultural discoveries. We also found that we loved each other's company. 
we could get into deep conversations that would last for hours. The pair became known as the Terror Twins, and it seemed that Def Leppard had created an even bigger alcohol-fueled monster with the addition of Colin. Leppard's upcoming album would feature Colin only sparingly with most of Willis's rhythm tracks being retained on the release. But after months in the studio, the band emerged with their third album, Pyromania, which was a tonal shift away from the heavy, more metal sounds of the previous albums, and it turned more towards a pop-oriented radio-friendly sound. The shift had the desired effect with Pyromania turning into a bona fide worldwide smash. The album would rise to number two in the US album charts, being kept from number one only by Michael Jackson's Thriller. Bad luck there, but Clark's musical riffage owned this album with top 40 hits like Foolin', Rock of Ages, and the smash hit Photograph, merging with more old school leopard tunes like Rock Rock Till You Drop and Die Hard the Hunter. The album spun Leopard's touring schedule on its axis as the band now found themselves as the top live act and a bona fide headliner. Most Leopard fans view this album as their peak LP performance, even though their next album would cement the band as probably the biggest rock act of the 1980s. But it would be a long, hard road to get to that pinnacle. Initially, Leopard's next album began pre-production shortly after the main Pyromania tour, but Mutt Lang would quit the album citing exhaustion amid a non-stop schedule going back for several years. The band found themselves in an uncertain place, unsure of what to do next. The record company would set them up with legendary songwriter Jim Steinman, who was not known for his production prowess, and immediately the band found themselves at loggerheads with the Bat Out of Hell author. Steinman wanted to return to a dirtier, more raw sound, while the band wanted to continue with their polished, radio-ready format. After a Steinman-produced version of Don't Shoot Shotgun went nowhere, the band parted ways with him to attempt a self-produced album with Lang's engineer Nigel Green, again without success. Leopard would scrap the sessions and continue to founder without direction. But it would only get worse for the band as a car wreck would change the life of their drummer Rick Allen forever. On New Year's Eve 1984, Allen was driving his Corvette on the A57 and took a turn too fast with the car leaving the roadway and smashing through a dry stone wall. Alan's arm was torn off by the impact and is being thrown through the sunroof. Despite Doctor's best efforts, Alan would lose his left arm a short time later. Despite the injury that would sideline most other drummers, Alan committed himself to continuing on as the drummer for Def Leppard, and he quickly began working with electronics experts and V-drum company Simmons to create a new kit that could utilize his feet for some of the parts that his left arm would have done. After only a few short months, Alan called the band into his practice room and played Led Zeppelin's When the Levy Breaks on his new kit. Joe Elliott remembers it being a moment of very high emotions. But with that episode behind them, the band knew that it was time to get back to work on their next album. Luckily, by mid-1986, Mutt Lang was ready to work again and seemed reinvigorated to produce what most fans would consider his masterwork. He envisioned an album in which every song could be released as a single, a monstrous collection of melodic rock masterpieces in their own right. Lang's meticulous approach saw the band playing each instrument separately and the guitarist using the Rock Man box, which had been developed by Boston leader Tom Schultz. Although the band was initially reticent to use the, quote, shitty little boxes, Lang felt that they were the only equipment that could handle the layering of the guitars that he envisioned. Over the course of nearly the next year, Def Leppard labored to finish the over 60-minute long album. Finally, in July of 1987, the first single from the album, Hysteria, would be released in the UK with Animal. The track, Women, was chosen as the lead single in the US and Canada. They would be the first of seven singles released from the album, and, predictably, it would take a little bit of time for Def Leppard to regain the momentum that they lost after such a long absence following the success of Pyromania. The album's $5 million price tag had made it the most expensive album ever made in the UK at the time, but once the train got rolling, it couldn't be stopped. Pour Some Sugar On Me, the song that the band is best known for, was released as a single in September of 1987, and with the success of it as a single and the MTV video, would propel Hysteria to the top of the album charts in Norway, Australia, New Zealand, and of course, the US and the UK. 
Hysteria would go on to stay in the upper portion of the album's charts for nearly three years, selling 12 million copies and becoming the 51st biggest selling album in the U.S. of all time. But of course, all of this success came at a price. Collins and Clark's drinking problems seemed to increase at a commensurate rate to the band's success. Fearful of his health and unwilling to lose his life to substance abuse, Phil Collins would quit drinking, become a vegetarian, and adopt a healthy lifestyle after several blackout incidents led him to question whether alcohol would eventually take over and end his life. Despite his fierce friendship with Steve, Phil could not get his bandmate to follow in his footsteps towards sobriety, and Steve seemed to only get worse as his alcohol addiction slowly began to control him. Colin remembers, quote, In a way, Steve didn't have much choice in the matter. He was surrounded by drink most of his life. Steve's dad was a taxi driver, and I think Steve was always trying to prove he was worthy of his rock star status. Steve had to prove his manhood to his dad all the time that he had the values of a Sheffield steelworker underneath his golden splendor. Steve slowly began to spiral out of control. Colin remembered that Clark would wake up in the morning with uncontrollable trembling that wouldn't stop until he'd had several drinks at a local bar. The stop in Paris saw Steve end up in a hospital with alcohol poisoning, and finally, while in Minnesota, Steve was admitted to the hospital after nearly dying of alcohol poisoning. The doctor told the band that Clark's blood alcohol level was 0.59, nearly two-tenths higher than John Bonham's when he died. It seemed that Clark had finally seen the light. He would be given a six-month leave from the band and entered a rehab center in Tucson, Arizona to try and dry out. Clark would find more than sobriety, however, as he met another patient named Janie Dean who was trying to kick a heroin addiction. The pair each promised to help the other maintain sobriety after treatment. They quickly became inseparable, fell in love, which culminated in an engagement. But the relationship would only end up making things worse for the pair. Janie would eventually start using again, and Clark was quick behind her with each enabling each other to heights that seemed even worse than before. Colin said that despite his best efforts, he found it nearly impossible to find Clark to keep him out of trouble. After several weeks of fruitless chasing and phone calls, Clark would finally be found dead on his couch by Janie on 8 January 1991. The post-mortem found a blood alcohol level of 0 0.30 mixed with a high level of prescription morphine. This duo of drugs and alcohol killed Steve in his sleep and he was only 30 years old. Steve's story is yet another that illustrates the immense pressures of the rock star lifestyle. While we often roll our eyes and wonder how somebody who's up on stage playing music considers themselves under pressure, the fact is that creative output and success, while mostly subjective, puts Massive pressure on the songwriter and performer to keep pumping out good material. This, coupled with non-stop access to drugs and alcohol, often makes for a deadly combination. Hence, here we are, talking about yet another young man who died way too soon. The guitarist, also known as White Lightning, had pressure from many different fronts. His fellow bandmates, his fans, his family, and finally, and most importantly, himself. Def Leppard would quickly move on, adding former Dio guitarist Vivian Campbell to replace Clark in 1992, but the band never achieved anywhere near the successes that they had reached with Pyromania and Hysteria, which I believe is a testament to the riff master Steve Clark's ability to come up with catchy melodic riffs that have become timeless rock classics. When we look back on the greatest guitarists of all time, and especially the 80s, Steve's name is regularly forgotten in a crowded field of hair and glam metal bands from that period, and that's an absolute crying shame. But that's another episode of Forgotten Fretmasters. Please make sure that you hit the like button below to let YouTube know that you enjoyed this video and you think other rock fans would like to see it. Also, be sure you're subscribed to the Guitar Story and channel and click the bell icon to get notified whenever we post new content. I'll be posting a poll with the three guitarists I'm considering for our next episode of Forgotten Fretmasters, and you can vote for who we all see next. Until then, we'll see you next time on the Guitar Historian channel, and thanks for watching.